All right, well, I know people are still trickling in, but we have a lot to cover today. So I want to kind of get us started so that we can really maximize this hour. Um, so hello and welcome to our uh, conversation today. I'm very excited to just uh, facilitate this conversation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Grace Strass, and I am the Assistant Director of Communications and Alumni Engagement here at the School of Nursing. And before we jump into our discussion today, I just want to cover just a few housekeeping items. Uh, starting with, please keep yourself on mute. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing that to avoid any audio issues. And we know a lot of people want to hear about this conversation, but weren't able to join us. So please note that this is being recorded and it will be shared with a follow-up email sometime tomorrow. And then in terms of an agenda, I do plan on starting with some questions for our panelists, but we also want to hear from you. So if you think of anything as we're speaking, please feel free to utilize our chat feature. Um, and then afterwards, I will open it up if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question directly. Uh, so now I'm just going to jump in by briefly introducing each of our panelists. Uh, so we're very happy to be joined today by Amanda Farrell, who is the HIV training coordinator and a registered nurse at Erie County Medical Center. Uh, Caitlin Bielman, a psychiatric case manager at the U Center for Wellness and Brightside Counseling Services. Jeannie Davis, a 2021 graduate from our BS to DNP Family Nurse Practitioner Program, whose DNP project focused on school-based nurse practitioners' perception of the health needs of transgender and gender nonconforming adolescents. And Christina Strauss, a current DNP student here at the School of Nursing, whose DNP project was about the healthcare providers, or about, I'm sorry, what healthcare providers need to know when caring for transgender individuals. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us here today. And before we jump into our questions, I do want to ask each of you just to give a very brief overview of uh, your role within the LGBTQ plus co uh, population to get this conversation started. So Amanda, would you like to start us off with that? Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda. I'm a nurse here at ECMC. Specifically, I work in the Youth Center for Wellness, which is ECMC's HIV and Infectious Disease Clinic. So we service patients who have HIV or who are at risk for HIV. Um, so we do service a lot of folks in the LGBTQ community, um, also folks who aren't, but today we are focusing on the LGBTQ community and their health, and we're very excited to be here. Fantastic. I know Caitlin's sitting right next to you. Caitlin, would you like to go next? <laughs> yeah. um, my name is Caitlin. I am the psychiatric case manager, licensed mental health counselor, in the clinic. Um, I work with the population here um, and provide individual counseling, group counseling, um, like interventions if there's patients who are showing suicidal ideation. Um, I also work at Brightside Counseling where I specialize with the LGBTQ community and also on talk space as well, where I do um, specialize in that population as well. Fantastic, thank you so much, Caitlin. Jeannie, would you like to go next? Sure, uh, well, first and foremost, I definitely consider myself as an ally for this community and also as an educator to my fellow healthcare providers. I was actually an NP student when I first took on the role as an educator by first noticing firsthand the gaps in care and knowledge of transgender health among healthcare providers at one of my clinical sites. And this clinical rotation actually inspired my DNP project. And since completing my project, I am fortunate enough to have it had been published by the Journal of School Nursing, of course, with immense expertise and guidance from my advisors, Dr. Heckenberg and Dr. Pafflehem. And I recently graduated a month ago, so I'm looking for jobs, but I have a great interest in finding a job locally that cares for transgender patients as well. Great, thank you so much, Jeannie. And last but not least, Christina, do you wanna give us a little bit of background? Sure, uh, my name is Christina Strauss. My pronouns are she and her. And um, this all started, I was a psych major, and so I wrote my thesis on uh, gender variance and psychosexual brain development. And then um, I went to nursing school at Villanova and then I, sorry about that noise. Um, I worked in New York City at Mount Sinai and I think it was like 2016, uh, they incorporated a center for transgender individuals 
Um, and I also had colleagues that were transgender. So I've just always uh, had an interest in this marginalized population. And as, uh, as well as Jeannie, I consider myself an ally. And so, and then I did my DMP project as you already stated. Um, and yeah, and I'm a senior and so I have one more year to go. And I'm definitely seeing a lot more uh, individuals coming into the hospital for um, surgeries and experiencing um, providers that don't know a lot. So it's nice to be able to educate colleagues and explain things to those who don't know. Fantastic, thank you so much, Christina. Uh, now I'd like to ask our Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, sorry, Amy Heckenberg, to provide some information about the current state of healthcare for the LGBTQ plus community. Thank you, Grace. And let me tell you, she kept me very strict to my um, time frame, So this is gonna be really quick. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today because improving the health and well-being of LGBTQ plus populations has really been a crusade for me for my entire academic career. Um, my research in sexual and gender minority or SGM health began way back in the 1990s when I was in grad school and conducting research about the experiences of lesbian moms. And since then, my research in this area is diversified and includes a focus on bisexual health and disparities and interpersonal victimization among sexual minority women and SGM couples. And I'm really excited because my colleague here in the School of Nursing, Dr. Jennifer Livingston and I, also recently received unofficial word from NIH that our R01 will likely be funded and in that study, we're seeking a better understanding of risky health behaviors and outcomes associated with peer victimization among LGBTQ plus youth. So we're excited about that. Well, as you all know, it's Pride Month and uh, messages of love is love are all around us. Um, visibility is definitely improving for LGBTQ plus folks, but it's often difficult to get a good sense of the size and scope of this population in the US. Um, a 2020 Gallup poll, so pretty recently, found that estimates of self-identification as LGBT in the U.S. are rising among adults, which probably isn't surprising, um, with 5.6% of adults identifying as LGBT. And this is up from the 2000 esti 2017 estimates of 4.5% uh, in their prior poll. The majority of those identifying as LGBT say they're bisexual, which a lot of people aren't aware of. And as you may guess, younger generations are increasingly likely to consider themselves LGBTQ+. For example, about one in six of the adults who were between 18 to 23 years old in 2020 in this poll identified with sexual identities other than heterosexual. And as you can probably guess too, this is likely a pretty gross underestimation due to the difficulties of measuring sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, but there's really no denying that this is a lot of people. Therefore, it's really critical that we have these important discussions like we're having here today about ways to improve health equity for these large and diverse LGBTQ plus populations. In 2016, the NIH formally designated sexual and gender minorities as a health disparity population. And so what are we talking about when we um, think about the health, health disparities um, that make this population uh, disadvantaged? Well, um, it's pretty clear in the literature that um, population-based findings indicate that SGM populations report riskier drinking patterns, higher rates of some cancers, more severe mental health symptoms, greater health problems among um, individuals, particularly among those um, who are older LGBTQ plus folks, higher rates of experiences of violence across the lifespan. And those are just to name a few. We're really getting a clear understanding of the, the disparities in this population. In addition, SGM populations are disadvantaged in terms of the structural determinants of health. They report lower incomes, more housing instability, higher unemployment, higher rates of homelessness, and more of them are uninsured or underinsured. And of particular importance for the conversation today, they also continue to experience explicit and implicit bias in healthcare settings that make them reluctant to seek care and this, as you can guess, further propels them into poor health. SGM populations are really diverse um, and rates of adverse health outcomes and risky health behaviors vary within this population by gender and sexual identity. For example, bisexuals who, um, particularly bisexual women who are um, a population of interest to me, 
are at higher risk than lesbian and gay folks for heavy drinking, poor mental health outcomes, and experiencing interpersonal violence across the lifespan. These health outcomes, excuse me, are well established in the literature, although distinctions within the population are still being clarified. And the health of transgender and gender nonconforming populations is one area that is growing, but still not sufficiently robust to know precisely how they're disadvantaged and why compared to sexual minorities. But it's really clear that this population, which still suffers from legal and social discrimination, are extremely at risk for poor health outcomes. Um, the new Future of Nursing 2020 to 2030 report by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine argues that, and I'm quoting here, nurses close connection with patients and communities, their role as advocates for well-being, and their placement across multiple types of settings make them well positioned to address social determinants of health and health equity. So in our role as health educators, the UB School of Nursing recognizes that it's critically important for us to educate our students about social determinants of health, about population health, about health equity within the public health and healthcare systems. And this education I'm really hoping will help improve future outcomes for LGBTQ plus individuals and other disadvantaged populations. So in recognition of these goals, it's really my pleasure to be here today and turn the conversation over to our experts who um, are gonna lend us more insights into the ways that nurses can best serve LGBTQ plus individuals. Great, thank you for that comprehensive overview, Amy. And thank you for sticking with it, our time limit. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to jump to our panelist questions now, and because each of our panelists have very specialized areas, I want to kind of keep them geared towards each panelist. Um, so I'm going to start with Amanda. Amanda, what are some common misconceptions and concerns that LGBTQ plus patients have when seeking health care? Um, yeah, so with common misconceptions and concerns, it's important to come from a place of compassion and understanding um, why our patients might have these misconceptions. And a lot of their misconceptions are because they've been part of a group that's been so stigmatized for so long and there's been so much bias against them. Um, a common misconception um, that I see quite frequently is a patient coming in through our door, assuming that it's not important for them to share with us what kind of sex they're engaging in and what kind of risk behaviors they're engaging in. Um, and the Department of Health People 2020 report recognizes that LGBTQ community has significant health disparities. Um, and this is because of stigma and mistreatment in the past. So it's important, um, again, for nurses to come from a place of compassion when we're asking our patients questions about risk and educating our patients why we are asking the questions that we're asking and why we're asking them to have the testing done that we're asking them to have done. Um, and just also to keep in mind, um, you know, patients are also used to maybe going to their primary care doctor and having their doctor not ask them about sexual behaviors, which in turn leads patients to have a fear of disclosure, whether it be they're worried about confidentiality, um, fear of a negative reaction, or they just don't feel that it's important to disclose behaviors because their primary did not acknowledge or ask. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. And kind of along the same terms, what are some common misconceptions that nurses have about the LGBTQ plus community? Sure, so common misconceptions, um, both that I've seen professionally and in my research um, would be that patients do not wanna talk about their sexual health. That's not true, but we need to open that door and we need to ask those very important questions so that we can do a full assessment. We don't wanna just leave out somebody's sexual health it's no different than asking a patient if their blood sugars have been abnormal or if their blood pressure has been abnormal. We need to ask these questions so that we can open those doors. Um, some more misconceptions that I have seen and found in my research are that certain words are slurs. Um, you know, language is always evolving. So really as a nurse, what I would recommend, especially if you're a newer nurse or just graduating is to mirror your patient's language um, and just ask, um, don't just assume, it's never good to assume about anything ever, but don't just assume that asking a patient a question relating to their identity or their sexual health is going to be offensive. And last but not least, another common misconception is just not realizing as nurses how complex humans are. 
um, and that there is an interplay between sex, between gender and orientation. And these can be varied and fluid and this can change over time. So just because a patient three years ago told you one thing, don't ever assume that that's still the status quo. Just know that as humans, we're very complex and we're always evolving and we can be very fluid and that things can change. So just never want to assume anything. Thank you, Amanda. And you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how can nurses create that welcoming, inclusive environment for LGBTQ plus patients? Sure. So uh, first and foremost, we can introduce ourselves. We can introduce our pronouns to make patients feel comfortable. We can ask specifically about behaviors to assess risk statuses. Again, asking those questions is so very important so that we're doing a, a full comprehensive assessment on our patients in front of us. We can use inclusive language and terminology. This is very important um, to provide accessible and affirming health care. Always, always, always be respectful and always be friendly and have a welcoming environment. So if you're in, um, say, an outpatient clinic, like, you know, it depends on what kind of uh, healthcare area that you're going to work in. But so in our clinic, um, there's things that we can do to be visibly welcoming. So. We have um, some diversity signs hung up with rainbows, some safe space signs. Um, it, it just means a lot to a patient when you walk into a room and you you do a scope of the room and you say, okay, am I safe here? Um, it is, it's a very important tool that is so simple and we can do as nurses. I mean, you can go and hang up the sign <laughs> or the sticker or you know, um, yourself just, just to help our patients feel safe and welcome. Fantastic, thank you for that, Amanda. And we'll stay in that same little Zoom box and we'll head on over to Caitlin. <laughs> uh, Caitlin, can you please describe some of the psychosocial struggles that are facing the LGBTQ plus community and explain how these issues impact patients seeking healthcare? Sure, um, so I'm gonna start with the social issues because you need to understand the social issues and understand how the mental health issues are coming up. So a lot of the social issues people are still encountering, even though there's been tremendous like headway, you know, and acceptance um, and getting equal rights, but there's still a lot going on. So stigma, um, religion is a big one. Um, a lot of the religions, if they ha have been brought up to believe a certain way, believe that they're going to hell, you know, for, for being this way that's a lot of inner turmoil that they're facing right now. Um, discrimination in the population and outside the population. So sometimes there's even discrimination within um, because there's people of all races, genders, and then different sexualities, identities, and not everyone is uh, accepting of each other within the community. Um, legal discrimination, it's harder to find, get healthcare, employment, housing, marriage, adoptions, retirement benefits, um, lack of laws protecting against bullying in schools, uh, lack of social programs uh, for the community, um, youth, adults, and elders. Uh, they have a hard time connecting with family and getting that support from the family. Um, that's huge. Um, and so that's the social issue. <laughs> Some of the um, consequences for those social issues, um, isolation due to the stigma and safety concerns, truancy and dropout rates are much higher. Um, Non-identified health concerns, like we were kind of talking about um, because they don't feel safe now, people aren't going to doctors. So they have these health, issues that aren't being addressed. Increase in STIs, um, increase in mental health, and increase in substance use. So those are the, the social issues um, that kind of lead to the mental health issues. Um, okay, so the mental health. Of the LGBTQ plus community, 61% have been diagnosed with depression. 45% PTSD and 36% with anxiety disorders. Um, the youth are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide. 40% um, of the youth have attempted or considered suicide in the past year. 40% um, of transgender 
individuals have attempted suicide sometime in their lifetime, which is actually nine times the national rate. Um, transgender youth have a four times uh, risk of developing depression and 60% of the LGBTQ youth have stopped some of their activities because of like because of sadness and hopelessness. Um, it's just like, there's a ton of statistics. I could go on forever. Um, transgender have higher rates of eating disorders. 42% um, of the men who have eating disorders identify as gay, lesbian and bisexual females struggle with binge eating disorder. Um, and LGBTQ youth have a 1.6 to 3.9 times greater risk of developing as, uh, PTSD. So those are some of the, the issues that we're facing um, with our patients, the patients in the community across the nation. Thank you for pointing those out, Caitlin. And can you talk about how nurses can work with mental health services and other members of a healthcare team to provide better care for LGBTQ plus patients? Yeah, so in our clinic, we do a really good job at working together. We have a very good integrated team. Um, and we make sure that we are completing, you know, the PHQ-9, the depression screening, um, one that number nine, if you guys are familiar with it, <laughs> it's the screening for depression. The ninth question um, asks if there's been any um, thoughts of killing yourself and harming yourself. Um, and if that shows to be positive, um, that we, we put a very strict safety precaution in. We have myself and the provider um, assess them to make sure that they're safe. Um, we link them with counseling. Um, the nurses will definitely let us know what's up, like if they're experiencing different, you know, different symptoms, the doctors will bring me in too. Um, but overall, like just same thing with like asking about pronouns and, you know, identity and sexual behaviors, like ask about the mental health. That's super important. It's not just the counselors that can do it. Yes, I'm here but in most, most of the um, clinics, there aren't counselors there. So the nurses need to be asking this when they're meeting with the patients usually right in the beginning so that if there is a risk that we can, you know, take charge and figure out how we can best um, keep this person safe and what we need to do. Great. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Now I'm going to jump over to Christina. Now, Christina, there are a lot of important terms to understand within the LGBTQ plus population. Can you please explain what transgender means and what gender dysphoria means? And can can you touch on if one has to have gender dysphoria to be considered transgender? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. All right, okay. So first of all, um, terminology is constantly evolving for the gender diverse population. And we should recognize that each individual really defines themselves and this should be respected. For example, those who physically transitioned used to be termed transsexuals. And while some, especially the older uh, generation identify with that term, they would be insulted to be called transgender. However, most use the term transgender. Transgender in its simplest definition means not identifying with one's birth anatomy. So their genital anatomy may be male, but their gender identity is female. And this has little to do, of course, with sexual orientation. And gender dysphoria is an extremely important term to understand. It, it, it is defined as the psychological or emotional distress resulting from this biologic discordance and is termed dysphoria. It can be related to how they are treated by family, friends, the healthcare system, the government, etc. And not all transgender people have dysphoria nor is it necessary um, to have to be considered transgender. And certainly those who transition, who are happy and not dysphoric are still considered transgender. 
Thank you, Christina. And why does there seem to be more individuals identifying as transgender in recent years? Okay, so while it may seem that there are more transgender people now than in the past, um, prior generations had neither the vocabulary, excuse me, vocabulary, nor did providers have any education or research to understand. Probably the largest impact has been due to the internet and where information is available to those who are transgender and providers alike. Additionally, there has been the gradual development of comprehensive transgender health centers, progressive research and more information available. So people who question their gender identity can, le can learn and realize that they aren't alone and are able to obtain care, whether it be like a local place or uh, finding a service online. Thank you, Christina. And now I'm gonna take it over to Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie, how should a nurse identify if a patient is transgender and how should that conversation begin? So first and foremost, I never assume a patient's gender identity. And second, communication is, is everything. So asking the patient is only the true way to uncover the patient's gender identity, their preferred pronouns and name. Beginning the visit by introducing yourself with your pronouns like Christina did in the beginning of this meeting is a great place to start because it will not only make the patient feel more comfortable, but they can take that as an opportunity to share theirs, which could have even changed since the last time you saw them. And intake forms can be a great guide as well, but only if they're inclusive. So advocating for inclusive health um, intake forms that encompass all gender identities will help you identify this population as well and help you open up that conversation. Thank you, Jeannie. And what are some important things for nurses to consider when caring for transgender individuals? So our panelists so greatly touched on many of these already, which is amazing, but nurses can play an important role in making our patients feel comfortable and safe. So many transgender patients actually delay care because they they fear that they're going to be judged or discriminated against by their nurse or their healthcare provider. So we can take that first step by combating this by providing an inclusive environment and using accurate and appropriate terminology and by using their preferred name and pronouns. And additionally, we need to be aware of the mental health implications of this population. As Caitlin said, mental health is a huge disparity within this population. So mental health screening, like screening for depression and suicide is another area that we need to pay close attention to. And finally, the physical health implications are often underlooked by healthcare providers. So patients need to, patients may have different body parts due to surgeries or hormones that may not align with traditional conceptions or male or female. So from a healthcare standpoint, we need to communicate with our patients in an open and non-judgmental way to collect this information so that we can provide the best care. And I'll give you an example. So I recently cared for a transgender woman who still had her prostate. So we discussed with her the need to check a prostate specific antigen or a PSA to evaluate for prostate cancer. So those are some things that we as nurses need to take into consideration. Thank you, Jeannie. And are there certain health implications to consider specific to transgender youth? So my DNP project focused on adolescents. So and we all remember adolescence. It's a very delicate time, really, especially for transgender patients, because they're still discovering and developing their gender identity while navigating their youth into adulthood. So the physical body changes that occur during puberty can cause added self turmoil. So evaluating their mental health is critical. Plus, we all know bullying has a large presence during youth, but, is, but it is especially detrimental to transgender youth because of those societal expectations of gender identity and expression. So as nurses, we also need to remember to evaluate their support systems and their home lives because they're still living at home with their parents. Um, so making sure that they have a good source of support and a good coping mechanism is important for us to know. And research has found, as Dr. Heckenberg said, many transgender youth use alcohol more than cisgender youth as a way to cope. So evaluating for substance use in, this, in, this, in these youths are really, is really important too and to be aware of with this age group. Thank you so much, Jeannie. 
Now, I know we've covered a lot in the last 30 minutes, but I do want to open this up now to if anyone on this call or anyone in Dr. Fabry's classroom uh, has any questions for our panelists here today. And you're free to unmute yourself, but also you can put something in the chat if you're more comfortable with that. Well, I'm gonna move along with some other questions, but please at any point, feel free to either pop a question in the chat or unmute yourselves. Um, Amanda, you talked a lot about the importance of discussing sexual health with patients. How can nurses empower patients to take control of their own sexual health? Um, so a great way that nurses can empower patients to take control of their sexual health is um, first and foremost, educating our patients. So educating our patients on why it's important to discuss um, who they're having sex with and what kind of sex that they're having with their primary care physician, um, maybe their OBGYN. Um, and just uh, on top of educating, so encourage routine HIV and STI testing. Um, something that we see a lot here is when we have patients come through our clinic, um, whether it be they're newly diagnosed with HIV, or they're just coming in for PrEP, which is a pill to prevent HIV. That is something that our clinic offers. We see patients both for HIV prevention PrEP and we see patients for HIV. Um, but patients sometimes have an assumption if they go to the ER and they want HIV or STD testing, but they don't really feel safe or comfortable telling the ER doctor what they want. They have an assumption if they go to the emergency room and say, I wanna be tested for everything, that they're going to be tested for everything. Um, and that is far from the case. So we have patients who come in and they're like, wait, I wasn't tested for HIV. I wasn't tested for syphilis. I wasn't tested for gonorrhea. I wasn't tested for chlamydia. I wasn't tested for hepatitis. Um, so it's just so important for nurses. I mean, we have such a crucial role in healthcare to educate and empower our patients. So in my role, I do a lot of follow-up for patients who are seen in the emergency room for HIV or STI testing. So I will go through the rundown sexual health one-on-one with them. I'll make sure they know what HIV is. I'll make sure they know um, what the common STIs are, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas. And I'll teach them um, to not only ask for those tests by name, um, but also to look for those tests. So the patient portal is a great tool um, that we have in 2021 where a patient can actually log on to their patient portal and look for themselves to see what they were tested for and when they were tested for it, um, just so that they know their status because knowing their HIV and STI status is such an important way to protect themselves and to keep themselves healthy. Um, Again, it just, it just goes down again to just encourage, encourage, encourage and educate so that we can empower our patients to um, really be an advocate for themselves, but also as nurses, we can advocate for our patients as well. Great, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, Christina, can you speak to if there, oh, I'm sorry, Amy, did you have a question? I do, um, I was wondering if all of you could, or some of you could uh, talk about how you think um, nursing schools could do better at training nurses to be um, prepared to, you know, care for their patients when they, their LGBTQ plus patients when they graduate. Uh, I have a comment on that. Um, I think back to when I was in nursing school, I graduated in 2013, so it feels like a while ago now, but just practice asking some of these questions because they can be awkward at first because most of us, um, when we go to the doctors, our doctors aren't even asking us. So we don't know how to ask these questions to our patients. And it's such an important part of healthcare. Um, there's so much focus on treating the patient as a whole and making sure that we're addressing everything. But sexual health seems to like just be left out whether the provider just feels uncomfortable. Um, which again, it, it can be uncomfortable at first, but once you do it so many times, it becomes way more comfortable. And I think just um, giving students an opportunity to practice um, really would go a long way. And then also just providing um, the education. I think back to when I was in, um, in nursing school, I think we had like two or three slides on a PowerPoint about HIV, STIs and LGBTQ health. Like it needs to be more, it needs to be more. We're not doing anyone any good by only talking about this subject for 60 seconds in a two hour lecture. Um, and we're missing, we're really missing the, the ball here with a lot of our patients, unfortunately, because of that. I have a comment as well. <laughs> um, 
I think it's really important while you're in nursing school to really address your own biases that you may have. Um, you might have feelings about this population that you're not even aware of or haven't felt comfortable discussing um, that could really impact your care for these patients. Um, so just kind of doing that inner work and like figuring out like, how do I feel about this? Do I feel comfortable with this population? Is there something that maybe I don't feel comfortable with? And with that, then you can also seek supervision from your professors. You can see anyone, anyone really. You could see a counselor talk about it, um, but really like figuring that out while you're in nursing school would be really beneficial for when you're out. I have something to say about um, this whole topic. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Mrs. Um, Lilly. <laughs> I'm an adjunct instructor at UB, and um, this past spring, our senior students um, were up on eight zone three and four. Um, actually, did a research project as part of um, their clinical and leadership course. And it really opened my eyes to the total lack of knowledge that really is out there. Um, it, it's mostly, I think, the younger generation seem to know a lot more, but it's it, we really need to get discussions going. And that was what was so great about this, because we did start talking to the nurses on both of these floors. The students... Um, created a wonderful pamphlet with, um, you know, little ways to help if, if you are taking care of a transgender patient, how to open the dialogue, because it is, it is tricky. And we you already talked about the pronouns and that one of the simple things to do is not use he, you know, she, her, it's to use um, they and their, if you're not sure what the person's, um, you know, gender identity is. One of the things I find um, confusing in all of this is the fact that we keep adding numbers to the LGBTQ. I noticed that, you know, even they have another, it's LGBTQ and I think it's IA now added at the end of this. So it becomes confusing and there's many there's so many definitions like gender fluid, gender, you know, cisgender, it gets very confusing. So when there is an education program developed, um, I think what I think is that we have to be very um, specific and, and not make it too overwhelming for the nurses. And the students really did a great job with that, with cutting down, you know, on the definitions and there is a lot of information there. And I think ECMC really is working to really get this into, you know, at the bedside so that nurses really are going to be able to handle this if they get a patient. But I think it's, we're only in the beginning steps, I think. We just did this in the spring. I don't know how you guys feel about that. But um, definitely education is the key. And I do know that. Um, Dr. Fabry told me that they are adding more information um, with the students at UB in their coursework. So hopefully this is going to really, you know, help. I have no idea what the other um, Kaleida or Catholic is doing. But anyway, I was I was happy to see the discussion, but also. I learned a lot myself and I, I kind of knew some stuff prior to this, but there is, there are people that really do not understand any of this. And um, that's a barrier that, you know, some of them just don't seem to want to. So it's a barrier and I don't know how we get around that, but the discussion helped a lot. Thank you for sharing that. And I noticed, Christina, that you had your hand up. Did you want to add anything? So this is what I did my DMP project on. Um, I had Dr. Sasana as my advisor. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, this is what I did. I made a, a, a toolkit 
to because that is the issue like this isn't it's like as you said earlier like it's touched upon but it really needs to like kind of have like its own module or like day spent on it and also one of and i think that the younger generation is definitely more open to um they just seem they seem more aware and more open to like learning and then what i i find that in the hospitals is where there's actually like a huge lack of um, education and understanding. Like even when I was working in New York, like none of my coworkers and I worked with over a hundred people just on my unit, didn't even know about the Center for Transgender Surgery. And I understand I work in a big hospital, but just, and it's, it's, you know, I, I know, well, maybe not the people who are like, when you work in a hospital, you'll learn this, the undergrads, but you always have these modules that like these re-education things or like up-to-date things. And um, so the people that have been working at the hospital for 30 years, like those are definitely like uh, a target audience that needs to be educated, not just the people that are coming into the hospital or people who are still in school it really needs to be an effort on all um, at all levels. But oh, and then um, I forgot. Like uh, one thing I noticed that the residents at the hospital they have their pronouns, or I see in some shops around Elmwood Village, like people have like their pronouns. And I just think having something like that, or having a symbol or a flag on your ID, shows that like you. Uh, are an ally and can maybe as a silent way to like start a conversation or uh, make the patient feel comfortable. Thank you so much, Christina. And I know Maria pointed out that there are a lot of terms. Um, so can anyone, any one of our panelists speak to some examples of clinical resources nurses can use to stay up to date on LGBTQ plus healthcare and terminology? I'll, I'll answer that one because I was actually going to say, Maria, there is um, this really great resource. It's the National LGBTQA Plus Health Education Center, and it's through the Fenway Institute. And they have great webinars and they are constantly updating their glossary. And it's very helpful for terminology. When I was writing my project, I referred to that constantly. And they're, they're very great at keeping that up to date. Um, so that's a one resource that you could use. Does anyone else want to add any additional resources? Um, you can, uh, there's something called WPASS, um, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And like, if you go to them, there's some like US PATH, which is basically the United States um, professional, Etc. Um, um, you can go to the American um, uh, Psychological Association, um, uh, UCSF has a, a lot of information on their website. Um, yeah, those are resources. Thank you so much. I know that was probably a lot to remember, so I will include a link to all of those in our follow-up email. And Jeannie, did you want to add something? I just had an idea for Dr. Heckenberg's question about improving nursing programs. Um, when I was in NP school, the class below us, um, they had a simulation where the patients were all transgender. So I think that would be a great thing for even us as UB to do for our undergrad students is have simulations with transgender patients or, or, or anybody like LGBTQ plus would be great. I think that'd be great for our nursing students and Dr. Fabry, if you're listening, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Did anyone else have any questions for our panelists or anything that they want to share about their own experiences? Sue, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, 
I don't know if any of you will be able to comment on this, but I graduated from the School of Nursing in 1971. And at that time, Buffalo was not the place to be if you were anything other than heterosexual. Um, in my nursing class, there was nobody identified as gay. There was nobody identified as anything other than heterosexual, which means if anybody was other, and I'm assuming there were, um, they certainly didn't say anything because it would not have been accepted. Buffalo at that time had what I think were called blue laws. If men, I think this was aimed at men, were caught fornicating, they could be put in jail. And periodically, depending who the police were, that would be enforced. And I had gay friends come to me. I was working in the psych ER at Buffalo General. And I had gay friends come to me and ask what to do. And my advice at that time was for them to get out of Buffalo, which for the most part they did. That was just a terribly um, conservative area at that time. So I'm hearing a lot of things that I like today because my initial question was, has it changed? And from what I'm hearing, it sounds like it has to have changed because we have people in the doctoral programs, nurse practitioners who clearly are in tune with current times and current issues. Um, but I'm still wondering, has that area as a whole changed? Because some of the things that were commented on, like in terms of the older population and stuff, I'm wondering how much of that stuff is still going on and maybe people either don't know it or they know it and they don't care. Um, but I know it was, a, it was a big concern to me, actually not as much when I was there as after I got out, because I live in California and it is so different out here. And that's when I really realized how blue collar conservative Buffalo was and how there was so much in the nursing school that we did not get because it just wasn't part of the curriculum. I don't know if nobody knew that those were issues or they didn't have people qualified to teach us. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Sasana, would you like to share? Sure. So I had the pleasure of working with Christina on her DNP project and it was quite the journey because it turned out her original idea morphed into this toolkit to educate our um, doctoral level programs at, in our School of Nursing because there was such a need for putting together some kind of information or you know, education that our program coordinators could just use. So that's what our toolkit was about. So it goes over terminology and history and resources and all of those things. And this idea to do a toolkit for our program came because Christina's original idea was to go and interview some healthcare providers about their comfort level in caring for transgender individuals and went through the whole process of getting the study up and IRB approved and nobody volunteered to be interviewed um, to give us their information and their perceptions about you know, what they need to know, what they feel, whatever. So the next best step was, hey, you know what, an educational toolkit, what can we do to break the ice, to help, you know, break the stigma, to promote talk, to do whatever. And then that's really how it, it came about. So do I still think there's some issues and difficulty talking about it and whatever? Yeah. You know, but to try to educate our nurses, you know, our, for our future nurses and whatever, um, that's what we ended up doing and coming up with. Thank you so much for sharing that. Were there any other uh, questions that anyone had for our panelists? Or any other comments or ideas that we wanted to touch on? 
Well, how about for our panelists? Do any of you want to share things that we didn't cover today, but that you think that nurses should be aware of or thinking about? Amanda, I guess. Hi. Um, so I just think that something super important to remember as a nurse is um, to say thank you to our patients when they do disclose things to us um, or talk to us about things that um, are can be uncomfortable. Um, I think a thank you always goes a long way, but I think sometimes as nurses, I know I've been guilty of this myself, unfortunately, in the past is you get so caught up in like asking A, B, C, D, E that you forget to just pause and remember that the patient in front of you is a person and that might have been very difficult for them to disclose to you. So it's always important to um, say thank you to your patient for feeling comfortable and for talking to you. Um, and it gives you know nurses another moment, um, another opportunity to continue to educate and empower and just keep, open that door so that we can take care of our patient as a whole, whole patient. Thank you, Amanda. Did any one of our panelists want to share anything else? Um, I mean, if any of you are going to like go to the resources, I think it's important to um, also educate yourself on like, you know, what not to say, like only ask questions that are pertinent to, you know, to the surgery, if they're going for surgery. I mean, obviously health and physical uh, is different. Um, or if they've already started the transition process, don't ask what they used to look like. Um, Thank you very much. And I did see a question come through about uh, sharing these resources, specifically the toolkit. And I will be sending out an email tomorrow to everyone who registered for this event with both the recording of today's discussion and then also links to uh, that toolkit and also some of those other resources that we mentioned. And Christina? Oh, one last thing, which I think is important to mess, uh, to say, uh, starting next year on January 1st, um, medical providers and health systems and insurance companies um, will be required to use the new ICD-11 coding, um, saying gender incongruence as a medical, not psychiatric condition, which I think is pretty big and can really help individuals that um, maybe can't afford to get care because that will be required. Thank you for sharing that. We'll give a last call if anyone has any questions for our panelists. <laughs> And just so you know, if there's anything that you think of after the fact, I'm sure that our panelists would be happy to get back to you. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me directly. My name is Grace uh, Jaras, and you can email me at g-r-a-c-e-g-e-r -E -E at edu, and I will make sure to get you in touch with the appropriate panelists. But if no one else has any questions, then I would say that it's time to wrap up. Thank you so much to our panelists for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us here today and to aid this conversation. Uh oh, while she's frozen up, I'm going to put a, in a plug for everyone to check out um, our justice, equity, diversity, and, and thank inclusion. Thank you for joining us. Website. Sorry, you, you, you blanked out, Grace, for a second. So I stepped in. <laughs> I was just putting a plug in for everybody to check out our JEDI website on the School of Nursing um, website. And if you have any suggestions about um, future you know, presentations or content, I'd love to hear them. And I'll hand it back to you, Grace. Oh, she seems to be having some internet difficulties. So I think probably she was just tying it up and I want to Thank all of you on behalf of the school of nursing. Yes, Sue. I have one more comment. Um, although it's hard to realize that when you're in Buffalo because we've got so many nursing schools there. But your average nurse, I would say, is at the bachelor's level. Your bedside nurses, if they still exist, they're at the bachelor's level. And I think more needs to be done to educate them. If they're taking care of the pre-op or post-op surgical patient, and they know next to nothing about what those surgeries are going to involve, 
they're not going to know what they're what they need to do for that patient. And I know definitely when I was in nursing school, hopefully not now, but I think more needs to be done at the undergraduate level to make sure that nurses know what they need to know. But as, in terms of a lot of the stuff we were discussing today, I think we need to go earlier and younger with that. I'm sorry, all, I don't know what happened. I, I was frozen and then I got kicked off, but I'm back, I don't know what I missed. Um, but thank you so much, Amy, for sticking, or for coming in and to giving those update about the JEDI committee. Um, and were there any other questions that we wanted to address before we signed off for the evening? Oh, Amanda, yes. Hi, um, I think just to touch on what Sue just said, definitely a great point. And I think that's where it's so important to, um, seek out the continuing education. I mean, it would be great if our healthcare facilities would all require it, but as nurses, um, we can seek out this continuing education on our own. So whether it be those resources that were provided to us, these great websites, um, Google can be incredibly helpful. You know, if you Google how to take care of um, a transgender patient before surgery, there are so many different resources out there. And I think that's just where it's so important to know um, personally, where you're lacking and where you could use to grow and what information you personally need to know so that we can provide the best care for our patients. That's a great point, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing that. But if that is all, I'm not sure if you heard me signing off before, but I want to thank you all for joining us and make sure to send me any questions that you have and I'll make sure to get them answered for you. And other than that, I hope you all have a wonderful evening.